In the final video of the history of question answering, I'm going to talk about some more recent resources that bridge the history of question answering to what's going on in the 21st century. I wanted to talk about it in the historical context, however, because much of the history of question answering is grounded in knowledge bases. So when you use a knowledge base today, much of its design was inspired by and addresses deficiencies that were exposed in the old school knowledge bases that we talked about before. And this is often in opposition to the machine reading paradigm for question answering that we'll talk about soon. For this video, I'm going to be talking about chapter two of question answering for the curated web written by two folks who worked with Gerhard Weikum in Saarland, although uh, Avishak is now in Niedersachsen. Uh, link to the book in the description. In some ways, things haven't changed that much from baseball or lunar. To answer a question using a knowledge base, you need to take text, map it into a symbolic form, and then query some database. What's different today is that A, the incoming text is noisier, often raw questions come from the web, and then you use the statistical approach to interpret it, and B, the database is also noisier and much bigger because these are crowdsourced. So that means that the same sort of statistical techniques that we talked about in Watson have to be applied to these KBs. In modern knowledge bases, you're linking entities together. For example, Christopher Nolan is an entity, and he is linked to the film Dunkirk, also an entity. The link between entities in these knowledge bases is a predicate. In this case, Christopher Nolan is the director of Dunkirk. And then you have other things in the knowledge base that aren't entities, like Christopher Nolan's date of birth being July 30th, 1970. These are called literals. Then you also have another relationship that encodes types. This says that Dunkirk is a film or that Christopher Nolan is a human. This is useful for figuring out, for instance, that the lexical answer type Watson is looking for should be a film like Dunkirk when the clue mentions this film. This is an idealized form of a knowledge base, but as I said before, real-world knowledge bases today are messier. Let's take a look at how this looks in Wikidata, a crowdsourced knowledge base. What's new here that we haven't seen before? First, there's an entity description. When a knowledge base is big enough, you need to know what the heck an entity is. And whether this is a comic by David Fringe, the comic by Frank Miller, a roller coaster, or the pitcher Matt Harvey. The description lets us know that, oh, this is a Christopher Nolan film. You also have an ID to make it easier to look up an entity rather than by name, since the Dark Knight could refer to all of those things. Both of these are doing similar things. A computer can keep track of all of these entity IDs, but a human can't. I need the string to tell me which Dark Knight we're talking about here. Wikidata calls some of the predicates qualifiers. Why is that? Because a predicate isn't always true. It's qualified. It's true in a particular case. Canada's primary language is English, except in Quebec. The population of Keokuk, Iowa was 10,780 in 2010. And Christian Bale plays Bruce Wayne. But the predicate linking the Dark Knight to Christian Bale has additional qualifiers to tell you that he played Bruce Wayne. This doesn't mean that Bruce Wayne is always played by Christian Bale. The predicate is only telling you that you can trust that Christian Bale plays Bruce Wayne in this movie. Now, if you were to approach this like an old school AI system, you'd create a query on the knowledge base. There are plenty of modern tools to do this, like Sparkle, which looks a lot like SQL, which you may be familiar with. But the same challenge that bedeviled our old school AI systems hasn't gone away. How do you deal with the uncertainty of language, ambiguity within the database, and conflicting interpretations? This is where you need better techniques and representations. Symbolic representations aren't as effective for conveying similarity and ambiguity. So as we talk about some of the representational techniques of modern machine learning applied to question answering, think about how this can address the challenges that hampered old school question answering. This is just a single lecture from a course. YouTube likes to show you these videos out of order, but if you go to the course webpage linked below, you can see the lectures in the right order, and you can get resources like homeworks or suggested reading. You can also visit quanta.org 
if you want to learn about our systems for creating computers that can answer questions, where Quanta stands for question answering is not a trivial activity. If you want to help the channel, provide a big gradient to the algorithm by liking and subscribing.